Absolutely. Go ahead, Dan. Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of the Story Box podcast. Today, my friends, I'm delighted to welcome a doctor onto the show today. Now, I know you guys love hearing from doctors, and this one in particular, we're going to talk about all things about the immune system. That's an area that I haven't really touched on. His name is Dr. Bob Lahita. He's affectionately known as Dr. Bob. I'll be calling him Dr. Bob for the rest of this conversation because I, I love it. Uh, he's a clinical professor of medicine at Rut- Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School. Yep. I think I got it right. <laughs> a professor of New York Medical College and the chairman of the Department of Medicine at St. Jo- St. Joseph's Healthcare, Healthcare System. He's the author of six, more than 16 books and 150 scientific publications. So my goodness, this guy gets around. He's very, very popular. Uh, he has a new book coming out next year. I believe it is on the January the 5th. Yeah. It's called Immunity yeah. Strong. Uh, you can go and get a copy of it right now, I believe, pre-orders, everything like that. But Dr. Bob, can I welcome you so much to the Storybox podcast today, my friend? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. You have this incredible new book coming out next year, Immunity Strong, which is an area that I haven't really touched on on the show before, believe it or not. I've kind of touched on all these other areas, but honing in on the immune system and the importance of the immune system is something that I am fascinated by. Having my own health journey, my my audience knows that. But before we dive into all the amazing work that you're doing and and who you are as as a an amazing doctor, the first question that I do have for you is: What does success look like for you? What does success look like for me? Well, that's a very good question, Jay. I mean, can I call you Jay? You can. Yes. 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 Okay. So. First of all, uh, success in many ways for me is uh, taking care of and healing people of their myriad abnormalities and their maladies. I mean, I spend my day now as director of this new Institute for Autoimmune and Rheumatic Disease, and I see so many sick, sick people, not COVID patients, mind you. These are people with autoimmune and connective tissue diseases. But with COVID, there's a whole new layer of illness that I see, post-COVID syndrome, after the disease itself, after vaccinations. Uh, And I thought that this book, which I had not started writing at the pandemic's beginning, but well before the pandemic, I had this idea that people needed a book on immune disease. And lo and behold, the pandemic appeared and it has become a very popular, a very popular book. So that's my measure of success is how I can interact with people and heal them. My ministry is health and uh, well-being and healing. And um, to that end, I practice, I hope when I preach, I am the volunteer director of our emergency medical corps here and uh, in the next town as well, and have been doing emergency medicine, which is not the, the purview of a room, rheumatologist, immunologist, but I've been doing that for over 30 years. And uh, I enjoy uh, going with my ambulances and my my EMS crews, my emergency medical service people, basically young people, to emergencies uh, at night as a volunteer and on weekends. That's fun. And um, I I don't do as much of that now physically as I used to, but I still get out there for the big, big events. Uh, And uh, it's a burst of adrenaline that keeps me young. I can imagine. <laughs> you look very young, to be honest. Thank um, you very much. I'm how really long? Very how long have you been a doctor for? You said thirty years or or more. No, no, I've been a doctor for about fifty years. Five oh. Goodness. Because, me. Um, yeah, I I got my um, medical license in nineteen seventy six. So you know, it's been a while. Wow. What led you to wanting to become a doctor in the first place? Well, I um, believe it or not, I when I became, I don't know if you know what an Eagle Scout is, an Eagle Boy Scout. I do, Scout. yes. Yep, you know, I, I was do. an Eagle Boy Scout, and they said to me, well, what do you want to be? And I said, I'd like to be a foreign diplomat. <laughs> so they had this annual dinner for the Eagle Boy Scouts. There were about 50 of us in the whole state, and um, they couldn't find somebody that was a foreign diplomat to sit with me. <laughs> <laughs> So they had they had the president of a department store sit with me, and I thought, well, that was an interesting choice. But right after that, I began to take a wonder in biology as a high schooler, and I I really enjoyed all that there was about being uh, a scientist. But I had no idea that I was uh, that I could become a doctor. I knew it was a lot of work, 
Mm-hmm. And it was a lot of work. And um, I have a PhD in addition to an MD, so it was even double the amount of work. But I was always somebody who, um, for some reason, tried to overachieve. And I met a psychiatrist one time who said, well, you must be running away from something because you keep mount- you keep getting all these doctorates and you know, uh, doing all <laughs> writing and everything. So I said, I, well, I guess that's true, but you know, who knows? Must have some influence of my parents. What do you love the most about being a doctor? Oh, being a doctor. I, the most, the most I love is of course, uh, writing and, um, writing for my colleagues, uh, about medical topics. And, and every day when I see patients, I see something new. And um, I tell the nurses, you know, I said, we ought to write about this. There was a case today that a point which uh, was fascinating. And I realized that there are some clues to some of the diseases in just looking at people. And of course, I don't have my basic laboratory anymore, but I did at one point. I'd love to take some of the stuff and do a little bit of basic research and um, try to come up with some answers for some diseases like I'm sure your your listeners and, and viewers know fibromyalgia and yep. chronic fatigue syndrome, which yep. because of COVID, we have new clues as to the cause of those conditions. And mm-hmm. that's very exciting. So that's what I like to do. I like to take bedside medicine and translate it into basic science and vice versa. And where did your specific interest in the immune system, where did that come about and how? Rockefeller University at the time was Rockefeller Institute yep. in New York City. I was an intern and resident at Cornell Weill Medical School, which is down the street from Rockefeller. And I don't know if you know the story of the Rockefeller Institute. It's called the Nobel Factory yep. because they're, they're, they produce more Nobel winners than any other institution. And it's a very small place uh, going as it's a it's a great institution, a very inspiring institution. And I took an elective there when I was uh, training to be an internal medicine specialist. And I wound up over there uh, doing immunology, which I thought was going to be a three week elective. And it wound up becoming 12 years. Oh. <laughs> so, that's, so that's how I became an immunologist. My Ph.D. is in molecular microbiology. So I really asked to go over and study immunology because I didn't really know that much about immunology. And so they said, sure, sure, we'll put you in the great laboratory of a a very well-known immunologist named Professor Henry Kunkel. Uh, There's a lot of people in Australia know Henry. Henry's deceased now. That was back in the that was back in the 70s of the last century. And um, I joined his laboratory and I never I didn't leave for many, many years. So I want to get into all the interesting stuff for my audience at the moment, because like I was saying just a moment ago, I have a huge fascination with the immune system. I am someone that has uh, an immune disease um, in my esophagus. So something that I've had to deal with for. I know what it is already. (laughs) What what, what do you think it is? (laughs) Uh, No, you want me to tell? No, we, we have a thing in the United States called HIPAA. Uh, the uh, we we keep uh, people's health records quiet and secret, so it's I'm not going to expose <laughs> your uh, disease to the world. I'm I'm more than more than happy to say what it is because I can't pronounce it. <laughs> it's ah. um, uh, esophagitis or whatever it's called. It's some it's weird eosinophilic esophagitis. That's it. Yes, I knew so, I knew a doctor would be able to pronounce it. I can't pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> the all. Esophagitis. That's yes. it. Yeah. So I've got that, which affects uh, quite a bit of my life. And I never thought that hmm. something like that would, but I want to give my audience a little bit of context first before we dive a little bit deeper. Uh, so what is the immune system in the first place and why is it important? Well, it is more important now. It's as if God came down from heaven and did a uh, did me a favor by providing us in the world with a pandemic. And uh, believe me, that was not my intention. It was not my intent to have this uh, gift that seems to be keep on giving us. It's not really a gift. It's a scourge. Yeah. So the pandemic with the coronavirus uh, has provided with everybody some kind of a, uh, a keyhole view of the immune system, which I call biologic the biological soul, because the immune system is so important and I have been studying the immune system for well over 50, 50 years. And I've watched it go from uh, a very, very primitive view of cellular activity to a very advanced molecular view in the year 2021. 
And if I knew back then what I now know, I would have been extraordinarily uh, excited. And now with the pandemic, first I thought HIV and the AIDS epidemic, that was an epidemic. I thought that epidemic taught a lot of people about the immune system, but nothing prepared us for the pandemic with the coronavirus. Yeah. So the immune system is your protective network of the body. And I go into this in the book in a big way. The first chapters uh, talk about, I think it's the overview, about how we compare the immune system to a large police department in a large metropolis like Sydney or New York City, where I'm here very close. And the intricacies of those departments in protecting the metropolis are exactly what happens inside our bodies. And most of us are not mindful of the processes, the complexities and the imperceptible reactions that happen every millisecond of the day within our bowel, our brain, our lungs, our heart, it's an extraordinary respect that one gets after you read the book, hopefully, about how complex we are and how this pandemic has thrown a monkey wrench into something that is so complex and so perfect and is so able to protect us. However, if you do things to the immune system, like smoke cigarettes, or you are uh, overweight, super obese, for example, or you have uh, chronic lung disease or chronic heart disease, you know that the coronavirus or the pandemic, COVID-19 we'll call it, has wreaked havoc because the immune system is somewhat damaged and incapable of fully protecting you. And so this infection, as it has here in our country, produced 800,000 deaths and in the rest of the world, millions and millions of people. So the immune system is extremely important for people to understand. And, and immunity strong, I go into that. I talk about viruses, parasites, bacteria, not just COVID, because COVID is coming and going. Hopefully it will end in another couple of years. But this book hopefully will continue to inform and educate people very, very simply about what the immune system is and does. So how did it become the biological soul? Well, that was my wife, who's an artist. She is a world-class sculptor and she just did the statue of Frank Sinatra here in Hoboken, New Jersey. I don't know if you know, that was in the press. It's been in the press for the last two days. It wow. was quite an event and she sculpted his, uh, his likeness and it, it's a real hit. She said to me, well, you know, the immune system, and she's very spiritual, most artists are very spiritual. So yeah. she said, you know, I think of the immune system as the biological soul of the body because mm -hmm. it's there to keep us going well past 100 years of age. If you realize that your immune system is supposed to keep you alive, there's a duality within us, the spiritual soul and the biological soul. Mm -hmm. Both of them have different functions, but both of them are connected to the brain. So in the case of the immune system, it's mind, body, and soul, soul yeah. being biological soul. So having said all that, I've got so many questions I'm trying to form in my head, which one I want to ask first, but the, the one that is coming to mind at the moment is, so that means that the immune system is all over the body or is it located in one specific area of the body? All over the body. Huh. You have lymph nodes all everywhere, particularly around the openings of the body, your mouth, you have the tonsils, the rectum, there are patches of, it, of the, there are patches of lymph nodes around the genitalia, the rectum, uh, in the armpits, uh, anywhere where there's possible ingress of antigens or foreign material. And I call those the police precincts of the body to make you understand. Yeah. Um, the, the city hall is the, the thymus gland, which disappears, by the way, as you reach puberty and beyond, not in everybody, however. And so the immune system is everywhere. There are circulating T cells and B cells at all times. And the brain, which is a very chosen part of the body, the brain has its own immune system. It has microglial cells and astrocytes that are comparable to the lymphocytes and B cells that are peripheral. But the brain is kind of like a privileged site. To get into the brain itself, you have to go through uh, something we call in medicine, the choroid plexus, which yeah. is where your spinal fluid comes from. And um, special cells have to get special permission to enter the brain and the spinal fluid. And so this virus, the COVID virus, 
concentrates in the brain about a thousand times than in the rest of the body. And the brain has to deal with it, immunologically speaking. Many communication molecules that are in the peripheral body are also in the brain. But the brain directs what goes on in the rest of the body. So if the brain gives a command, it does through hormones and through chemicals called cytokines and chemokines, it directs the immune system in the rest of the body. If you step on a nail, for example, and you injure your foot, that's a signal that goes out to the entire immune system. It, you know, flashing, there's something called innate immunity, which is, I call it in the book, the SWAT team of the body. It goes right to the foot. The foot gets red, swollen, you're painful. Sometimes it's infected, you get a fever. And that is all explained. And it is something that's somewhat beautiful to understand. It really is. This is all fascinating. So the brain itself, you said, has its own immune system, yet mm-hmm. the body works like in conjunction with in, the brain in conjunction with the brain so yeah. does that mean that the brain is kind of controlling the rest of the body at the same time like the rest of the immune system yeah. that's right yes. yeah no doubt the immune system has some um integrity of its own and it is it it has the ability locally to act right. but if you're depressed or stressed and, you know, people ask me this all the time and we see it in real time. And I'm not one of those nutty guys that believes that, you know, if you eat rutabaga, your immune system <laughs> will be terrific and it's going to explode. But the brain really acts from the standpoint of depression, uh, sadness. Um, we know that host resistance goes down when you're stressed. So if you're in a divorce, you're taking an exam, you're selling your house and moving, you're traveling, you've uh, you've lost relatives in some catastrophe, your immune system immediately reacts, hopefully in a positive way to protect you. But the brain, really your behavior affects the the biological soul. Mm -hmm. It it affects your mind, affects your body's functions and your body's functions obviously direct your heart, its its function, your heartbeat, the, the amount of adrenaline that's in you, which also affects the immune system, how your thyroid works, hormones, all sorts of neuro and regular endocrine hormones influence what goes on in your body, in the immune system. So, so how resilient it, is your immune system? Extremely resilient. It is actually taking care of infectious processes every second of the day. And that brings us to the biomes. Mm. And I don't know if you were going to ask me about the biomes, but chapter, I think it's two or three, I talk about the microbiomes. Most people Mm. are now waking up to the biome stuff. Biomes are collections of organisms that live within us. Most of them live within our bowel. So our bowels are populated by trillions of bacteria, many viruses, and many parasites, but also your skin has a biome, your lungs have a biome, Um, your heart and its tissues have a biome, and the vasculature has a biome. So these biomes are now populations of organisms that live along with us. We're not aware of them, but they are very important to the integrity of immune function. So for example, a germ-free mouse who is given influenza and then given a vaccine will not produce a good immune response to the influenza virus. Right. However, if that mouse has a normal flora, has bacteria in its bowel, it will mount a very good immune response. Yep. And in the book, I talk about the, the bad use of antibiotics and the destruction. And I'm sure you've heard about prebiotics and postbiotics yep. People go and buy them. You can get them in the supermarket now. You can buy uh, certain kinds of yogurt, lacto, lactobacillus acidophilus, and all these things to populate your bowel. That's a very important part of the a very important part of immune immunity and immune function is to make sure that your biomes are stable. And I talk about that in the book in a big way. It's yeah. a very big topic. We could talk for a couple of hours just on that one topic. I've heard from other doctors, the importance of taking care of one's gut. I mean, Dr. Stephen Gundry, he talks about it. Another friend and doctor, Dr. Will Cole, he talks about it too. So the gut I know has its own unique system. 
that plays yeah. out and how it affects the immune system and the rest of the body. And you're right, we could talk about it so so long, but we could. You did mention like the the vaccine thing, um, and I wanted to ask like before we dive into the vaccines, um, if you are why in, why in the first place do we become immune compromised? What happens when we do become immune compromised? Well. Some there are several layers to that question. First of all, there are people out there with uh, immune deficits, or yeah, um, yeah. Uh, the, I forget what it's called, IEI, inborn errors of immunity. Inborn yeah. errors of immunity. We're learning who they are now with the COVID nineteen infection. You'll get a perfectly healthy soccer player or a lacrosse player who's like twenty five years old. And he's a picture of health. Physique is great. Very healthy looking young guy gets the COVID and dies within three days. Yeah. And everybody says, how could that happen? How could this happen? Well, there are several reasons for it. You don't know what your immune system is like. Uh, no one does until you're challenged. Uh, for the most part, 99.9% .9 of us are protected and our immune systems work. It depends on your immunogenetics. It depends on your grandparents and your great grandparents as to how you're going to respond to this foreign invasion of what we call antigens. Antigens are foreign substances. It can be milk protein, it can be the splinter in your foot, it can be a pneumococcus that gets into your lung, <clears throat> and all sorts of possibilities. So this is very, very important. It's very important to understand that each of our immune systems reacts differently to antigens. For the most part, if you become immune compromised by taking chemotherapy on purpose to treat your cancer or your immune disease, if you are an alcoholic, you have lowered resistance, your white cells don't work the same as they would in a normal person. If you smoke, if you're a chain smoking cigarette smoker, we now know that that plays a major role in depressing immune function. If you are contaminated with uh, this or that illicit drug, if you're a heroin abuser, if you're on cocaine, your immune system is not what it should be. And you've done that to yourself, you've blown yourself up. Those are reversible, by the way, so you can change in a heartbeat. You can say, tomorrow I'm not gonna drink anymore, it's very difficult to stop, or I'm not gonna smoke, that's even harder. And then of course, if you're a drug addict, it's time to get help because your immune system is compromised by these various um, and exogenous, but yet willfully uh, mandated, you know, you do it to yourself. Yeah. So that's immunosuppression. And of course, age, I have to mention age. Mm. The older you get, there's such a thing called immunosenescence. Now, immunosenescence, and that's why the vaccine was so important to get for COVID for people over the age of 65, because we don't know how certain people's immune systems begin to decay and age. And so in the real world, as you approach 100 years of age, unless you take care of yourself and nurture your immune system, and you get an infection like a pandemic virus, you're dead. And that's exactly what happened. So, you know, uh, I think the numbers were like 80% of the people above 65 succumbed first to the coronavirus. So having, talking about the coronavirus and, and vaccines. And, and I do know the importance of older people getting vaccinated, but more or less even the younger generation too. Um, but I'm curious about if you are immune compromised, if you do have uh, an immune disease, is, yeah. it, is it still wise to get a, a vaccine or should you be more in line to get COVID? Which one? Because your immune system technically would fight off the, if you're young, say for example, you're, you're my age, your immune system would try and fight it off. And you've got, I guess that, what do they call it? COVID, is it that? No. Um, long, long haul COVID. No, uh, it's, um, I forgot the, the term of it. Like you're, you got, like you're immune to COVID pretty much. You've got those, the antibodies that, that build up when you do get infected. It's kind of like the natural vaccine kind of thing. Okay, um, I'm, let me ask this all the time and let me explain how this works. So why do we ask people who have had COVID, who are young to be vaccinated? And currently we're asking people over the age of five, five and above to be vaccinated. Yeah. And uh, that's exceedingly important. 
if I take 100 people who have been infected, and I did this, uh, and I measure neutralizing antibody, which is one part of the immune system, it's called the humoral part, which is where we measure neutralizing antibody to any antigen, but in presence right now is of COVID. Yep. Only 10 of those 100 people, or maybe 20 of them, will have high titered antibody. The way I know this is I sent all these people to be bled and have their plasma removed so I could give, this was early on in the pandemic, to provide convalescent serum, meaning they're convalescing from their disease, and they have high titers of antibody, I'm going to purify their antibody and infuse it into people who are critically ill. And we did that, and it worked. But only 20 out of those 100 that had COVID really had a great antibody response. Mm -hmm. Now, admittedly, the antibody response is only one half of the immune system. The other half is the cellular T cell, B cell response. We can't or didn't measure that. But that's why we're asking everybody to get the vaccine, because we don't know who the strong neutralizers are and who the weak neutralizers are after you've been naturally infected. So wow. it's a it's a crapshoot. And you right. know what a crapshoot is. It's a gamble. Uh, yeah. And we, we just don't know. We don't know. No, I don't want to take a chance. If I have grandchildren and um, I happen to have two very beautiful grandchildren who are 13 and uh, 10, Mm-hmm. And uh, they just got their second shots. And I'm very confident that they're protected now for the most part. And now we're saying over the age of 18, we give boosters yeah. uh, to protect you against the Omicron variant, which we, you can ask me about, but you may not want to. Uh, that Then we get into the complexities of the virus itself, <laughs> which could be another hour. <laughs> <laughs> yes. no, I mean, like it seems to me that, you know, um, the the actual coronavirus itself it, it is evolving at a pretty rapid rate and yeah, it yeah. kind of feels like we're 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 kind of in line with delta at the moment we've got a little bit on top of delta now a new one's coming out and does that yeah. mean that because the the coronavirus is constantly evolving does that mean yeah. that the virus will ever just fizzle out or does that mean that we're going to continue to just have more and more vaccines like we're we'll going to be jabbed every 5 or 6 months that sort of thing Well, that's a several part question and a several part answer. Number one, this virus will eventually peter out. I think it's going to probably peter out in 2023, my belief. The Omicron variant is one of many variants. And we've actually, we're running out of Greek letters. But the (laughs) Omicron, remember, there was a lambda and a mu that came from South America, uh, from Chile and uh, Peru, which I was very concerned about. And I was asked about ad nauseum. And I said, well, let's see what it does. Well, it didn't do anything. It fizzled out. Now, viruses upregulate and they downregulate. If they downregulate, they disappear. If they upregulate, you get mutants. The reason they're coming from South Africa is very simple. There are immunosuppressed people in South Africa because there are a lot of people with HIV who have been on HIV drugs and their immune systems are really not up to par. So they get infected and the virus resides in them for months. Mm. They're carriers essentially, just like you can be a carrier for hepatitis B or a carrier for hepatitis C. You can be a carrier of COVID. And while they're carriers, these viruses mutate. And the ones that upregulate and mutate to their great success, change the structure of the spike protein, or they have some new characteristic, because they're not living, mind you, these are particles, that they have some new characteristic where they can replicate faster and get transmitted faster. The virus's goal, if if a non-intelligent particle can have a goal, the goal goal of the virus is to stay alive. And that's why we have the mutants. But I think what you're getting to is this virus is going to become endemic endemic versus pandemic. Influenza is endemic, meaning that every year we have to get a new shot with different structural capability of the virus, the the antibody against the virus because the virus's coat changes. The influenza coat changes rapidly. Same thing with COVID, its coat changes. And so it's going to happen. So if someone was to have the vaccine as a way to protect themselves from getting COVID, or they, they, they were saying here in Australia that you get vaccinated, you know, you technically you won't get it, but that's not necessarily true. You may get it. And we're seeing the double dose 
and even some people that have gotten three doses are still getting it. Um, yes. But it just reduces your your chances of being hospitalized and and the all that sort of stuff. But right. where I'm getting at is, so if someone was to have the vaccine, and we're seeing reports of this, not as many that have been reported in the media, but there have been reports of this of people taking the vaccine and they've been having negative reactions to the vaccine. What's yes. happening with with that? Well, first of all, the negative reactions to the vaccine rashes, joint pains, the appearance of new antibodies, et cetera. That's a normal response of the biological soul or quote immune system to an antigen, which is now being injected into you. Right. So what's a little fever, what's a few joint pains, which will eventually go away compared to being on a respirator in the intensive care unit and dying without speaking to anybody in your family in person. That's what happens in people who really, really get sick. Right. <clears throat> so yes, you're absolutely right. It There are reactions. And secondly, there are breakthrough infections. But the breakthrough infections, again, your nasopharynx has receptors, as does your mouth and your eyes, to this virus, ACE2 receptors. So the virus gets in, sticks to those parts of your body, but it doesn't disseminate in your whole body because your immune system is protecting you. Right. So the police department sees the criminals, the criminals are there, they don't make any ingress into the body, but you can expel those viral particles and infect somebody else, even though you are vaccinated. It makes perfect sense when you think about it. Have the you, virus is multiplying, but not killing you. Have you heard or seen or even dealt with people that have been perfectly healthy before they've taken the vaccine and then all of a sudden they haven't been so healthy? Yes, I've seen that. And probably because the vaccine has unlocked some immune glitch. Right. I've seen people develop new autoantibodies. I've yeah. seen people develop new weakness of their extremities. I've got one young man who's about 26 who cannot drive the car because he cannot press the gas pedal or the brake pedal. Wow. He is so weak that it is dangerous for him to drive. Plus there's brain fog. Remember, the virus selects the brain to live in the nervous system. It loves the nervous system. And um, these people cannot balance their checkbooks. They can't remember where they're going half the time. I had one lady this afternoon who said she had COVID. And since she's had COVID, she can be in her car and, and forget where she's going. And yeah. it takes her 15 minutes to figure out why she got in the car in the first place. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of different things we're learning about how this virus works and how your immune system works. Everybody's immune system is different. Some are stronger than others. And in Immunity Strong, I talk about all of this stuff. And uh, this is really, really, really important and very timely for people. This is a quick read, too. It's only like, like 285 pages. And it's, it's Dr. Bob talking to you like I'm talking to you, Jay. Very simple, simple language. Because I know there are people around me that say, oh, my gosh, you're going to write another book and we're not going to understand it. And I'm going to say, no, <laughs> this book I wrote is Dr. Bob. My other textbooks and stuff are for physicians. I think it's a it's a needful book, especially because, I mean, not many people know too much about the immune system, like an average Joe, like myself here in, in here in Sydney, Australia, and how to actually protect it more from these advanced diseases that keep getting more advanced. And it kind of like, to me, I, I don't think, I'm like COVID, it was bad, it killed millions of people, no doubt about that. It's affected the economy, it's affected so many people, but I don't think that we have seen like the end of more bad diseases later on right. in the future. I feel like there's gonna be more later on. That's not being, that's not me being pessimistic at all. Right. That's just me being a realist in, in many respects because we see the Spanish flu, for example, we're seeing all throughout history, and yeah. it's just like, okay, we're, we're due for another one, that, that sort of feeling. So yep. I'm interested in, okay, so if we weren't to have these vaccines, because for a long time, we didn't have a COVID vaccine. So what can we do to prevent ourselves and build up our immune system um, more strong to prevent ourselves from getting sick from these deadly viruses? 
if we yes, didn't, well, if we didn't have a vaccine, right? I talk about all of those things in the book. The first thing you can do, we've already talked about, that's to eliminate toxins from your environment, like smoking, like yeah. alcohol, and to, you know, not to eliminate alcohol totally. Everybody goes out and has a glass of wine periodically. I'm not talking about that. Yeah. I'm talking about the person who's, who does a pint of gin every day and maybe two pints of gin every day. And believe me, we have those, yeah. you know, uh, uh, so you you just never know. Um, but these things are not good. And to keep your weight down. I mean, I run three miles every other day and I bicycle about four miles every mm-hmm. other day. So I alternate bicycling with running. And that keeps you young, aerobically keeps you fit. I also take multivitamins. I take vitamin E. I take vitamin D, which is in the multivitamin for my bones. And as you go forward, your immune system depends on these elements, it yep. depends on the elements to stay healthy and eating a good diet, not eating potato chips or whatever, but lots of veggies. And I know people have heard this and they're probably saying, oh, here he is again. No, it's true. You've got to do this. You know, you have to balance your diet. I also recommend yogurt to keep your biome going. Yep. And if you can't do that, uh, I enjoy a bowl of yogurt daily with a, with a little granola on it. That helps. Uh, and then I have a whole list of things in the book, like uh, turmeric, turmeric, yep. uh, which a lot of, and and I know the women are tuned into this more than the men are because my wife goes nuts. She has cabinets full of this stuff. And it, this is very good stuff. I don't sample all of the stuff that she takes, but these are things that will keep your immune system, things like magnesium, will keep your immune system going. It's, it's like a machine that needs to be well oiled. Yeah. And it's, it's, um, if you take care of your immune system, it'll take care of you. Yeah. Let's say I totally agree with the you. most important thing about it. And, and, and people say, well, I'm afraid of the messenger RNA vaccines. And then, by the way, I've got to say something about that. In the book, I talk about that, you know, 30 years ago, if we had a pandemic, like we have, we wouldn't have a vaccine for 10 years and we would lose billions of people, not millions, billions. Today, because of molecular medicine and because of our advances in science, we know how to make a messenger RNA, taking a piece of the virus out, analyzing it, creating artificial structures, putting it in something like an M&M, which is a a sugar-coated chocolate candy, which you take. This is injected into you. The RNA from the virus that's very important for the spike protein is in that chocolate and it goes into your arm and boom, it goes into your cells, never goes into the nucleus, but it makes spike protein and it fools your immune system. It tells your immune system, my gosh, you've already been infected. So I, there's not much damage I can do. Yeah. And that's what the vaccine's all about. And for them to say, at least in Pfizer, that they can produce an Omicron special vaccine in a hundred days is absolutely amazing. Yeah, Absolutely yeah. amazing. We've never been so expedient with our ability to change the function of the immune system as we are today. I'm curious about that, the ex- expedient nature of it, like, because we have been taught for quite some time that, you know, even for a flu vaccine, which it took quite a bit to actually get and form. Yeah. So I think the level of trust and yeah, just concern around it has like people are obviously concerned with taking a, a vaccine that came pretty quickly, so yes. to speak. And it's, they're still saying that it's in the third stages of trials, that sort of thing. So why should we take a third stage trial vaccine and even get a booster shot to get yeah. protect us against Omicron? You know, they, they've got all these things going on. So what's going on? Like, how can we, I'm not, I'm personally not against vaccines at all. Like I'm not one of those anti-vaxxers one bit. I've always been that person that has been about choice and having that ability to choose whether or not you want to get it or not. So, and I think it's been overly politicized so much more. So this is why I like the, the doctor side of things and removing the politics <laughs> out of the equation and just I getting agree. down to the nitty gritty science and saying, yeah. how can we affect our immune system better in, in more positive ways, that sort of thing. So I guess the question that I'm getting at is if it, if the vaccine is uh, in that third stage trial, that sort of thing, 
how do we know that it's safe? It's safe. First of all, in order to go to phase three, at least in the United States, um, it has to go to the FDA after two committees of experts and the data have to be looked at, the protective data, first in animals, phase one, and then uh, toxicity phase two, to make sure it's safe for young people, old people, et cetera, and now for pregnant people. And then phase three, where it's tried on something like 60,000 people every, for each vaccine. We in science have created these vaccines, which are extremely safe, more safe than actually the polio vaccine, uh, because there were a lot of glitches with the polio vaccine years and years ago, yeah. where um, there were what we call passenger viruses that were given to people inadvertently and uh, catastrophes happened. That's not possible with a molecular vaccine. This is a molecular vaccine. This vaccine is high tech, and the high tech means its safety is insured because we know exactly what we're giving. Uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and indeed the AstraZeneca vaccine, which you all heard about, is a viral vector vaccine where a, an innocuous virus is given to the person with particles of or pieces of the COVID virus in it. And so it gives you an innocuous cold-like infection, but it delivers the antigen or the virus to where it needs to go, to the biological soul, which then reacts. So these are very, very safe. And I can simply say that technology is not going to stand still. It is not today like it was 30 years ago, even 10 years ago. Who would have ever thought a messenger RNA vaccine would be available? Mm -hmm. But they have been available, but sparsely used over the years for different infections. So this is a whole new world. What people are afraid of is that it's new technology and we've stressed the newness of it. And so people are frightened and they're saying, well, I don't want to get anything new. I'm not a guinea pig. I don't want you to inject stuff into me that get into my cells and, and may change my fertility. I've heard every, every conceivable discussion about this, that I won't reproduce, that it causes erectile dysfunction in men, that it's given to people over 65 to eliminate the elderly, that a tracer is being put into us and it's going to follow us around for the next 50 years and so on and so forth. All these crazy things that uh, the people are, are doing. But I agree with you that freedom is important. So people should have the right to choose whether they want the vaccine or not. Yeah. But I will say this, it's not a question of whether you're going to have COVID. It's a question of when, if you're not vaccinated. If you're not vaccinated, you will be infected with something, one of the variants for sure. Yeah, I can see why people have been hesitant because of the fact of that new technology plus the government mandating it here in Australia. So a lot of people were like, hey, what's going on here? We don't have a choice. So what's going on? Why is the government doing this? Um, I'm so, so glad. I just thought the U.S. was like that. I didn't know Australia <laughs> had politicized the vaccine. Oh, my I goodness. we were the only ones in the world that did that. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable. Like, I never thought Australia would do something like that, but they did. And we sort of had to live with it. Um, we kind of had to adjust and and. But the thing is, the case numbers are still rising or they're beginning to rise even more. And they can't say that it's because of the unvaccinated. Now we've got 95% of the population that is fully vaxxed here in, here in Sydney, including myself. So why is the case numbers still rising? That sort of thing. And, you know, like it's going to happen. <laughs> That's just how it is. Like it's a virus, but there's so much fear and, uh, hate and divide that's been going on, Dr. Bob. Like it's, it's incredible, like over, over a vaccine, over a virus, over all this stuff. And I just like, I'm sitting back saying, come on, people, we're better than this. We should be better than this. Yeah, like you're absolutely right. Yeah, you're absolutely. Right. The stories, the things I hear, and these are my relatives, mind you, it's just yeah, not the same. public. I'm talking to people within my family that are anti-vaxxers. Yep. And it has nothing to do with autism or any of that stuff, which is a whole different layer. Uh, this has to do with their personal safety and their personal choice. Yep. And so you've seen the same thing in Australia as we're seeing here in the States. Yeah. Yeah. 
Times are changing, definitely, Dr. Bob, but I think your message is, is really, really important for people to hear and, and to read Immunity Strong as well. Um, I know that your time is is quite valuable, so I do have two final questions for you, if that's okay with you, Dr. Bob. Sure, really, sure. really have enjoyed this conversation. <laughs> it's been very oh, informative for me. Um, <laughs> so what do you hope the most for people to get out of your new book, Immunity Strong? I hope they get a full respect, not only of the immune system, but a respect of life in general and the complexities. You don't have to be a religious person to be spiritual. And uh, you'll see that uh, the biological functions that exist within us and how we're influenced by our environment is really, really important. And it's very spiritual that there is a mind, body, spirit that is in each of us. And it should be respected. It really should. Whether you're the poorest you know, migrant worker or the richest billionaire on the planet. We all have the same kind of immune systems, the same kind of processes, and um, and and these have to be understood and respected. Yeah, totally agree. There's got to be harmony amongst all three. Yeah. So amongst all of us, yeah. we're all we're all on this planet together. We all bleed the same kind of red blood, and we all get the same kind of infections. There you go. You heard it from a doctor, people. <laughs> a well-respected doctor too. So, Dr. Bob, this is my final question for you. Before I ask it, where do you want people to get a copy of this book? Oh, they can pre-order it on Amazon or through Barnes & Noble. It will be on store shelves on January the 5th, I'm told. Uh, but, we, you know, because of the pandemic, we've had supply chain problems. It was supposed to be out in early November. Uh, the immune system and the virus is uh, keeping pace with me. It is not disappearing. So people still need to know about how the immune system works. And this tells you how to stay strong and how to live a long life. And uh, if you follow everything that's in the book, you should do pretty well. Well, like I said, it's a needful book. I definitely am going to get myself a copy of it here in Sydney, Australia. And I hope many more people do as well. Dr. Bob, my final question for you, this is my all-time favorite question I ask everyone at the end. It's a hypothetical one, but I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you've been able to reach the age of 100 or when you get to the age of 100, I should say, and your family and friends have been able to put together a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Then ask me how in the world they got it all. We'll just call it magic for sake of argument. But they've been able to get it and show it to you on your 100th birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? Gosh, I, I want them. I want them. I want people to look at it and say, well, he wasn't that bad after all. And I will say to myself, if I knew I was going to live this long, I would smoke cigars and drink more scotch. But that, <laughs> that's just me. So I don't advise people to go out and do that. Nevertheless, I, I would like to be thought of as somebody who helped a lot of other people. And that's, that's the only thing I need to have happen. I think it's a great send off message. Dr. Bob, thank you so much for your time today, your story, your wisdom, your advice, and for, you know, having a, an informed conversation with me. I think I, I learned quite a bit, that I didn't know before, and it's always thank good you. getting new perspectives on things. So thank you so much, Dr. Bob, for joining me today on the Storybox podcast. Thank you, Jake. It's a pleasure. <laughs>